My younger employees, they really expect, like, you know, to really be successful financially, even though they don't necessarily put in the work. Welcome to the Let's Talk Business Podcast, a project of the PTEX Group. Gain valuable, actionable ideas from the world's top business leaders to help you take the next step in your business journey. And now, here is your host, Manny Hoffman. Comic D from the PTEX headquarters in Brooklyn, New York. This is the podcast for no-nonsense advice to help you learn, grow, and lead. Today, I'm so excited to welcome our guest, Bensi Alkabi. Bensi's incredible journey is nothing short of inspiring. From moving from the UK to the US and acquiring a friend's coaching business, Bensi turned a modest opportunity into a thriving enterprise, all without any prior business experience. In this episode, Bensi shares the mindset shift and strategies that fueled his success, offering invaluable lessons for leaders and people-focused industries. We'll explore how to scale a business sustainability by proving concepts and ensuring financial stability, the art of balancing personal and business branding to maximizing impact. We're also going to speak about actionable advice on reducing employer turnover, enhancing operational efficiency, and positioning services as a must-haves. And we'll also talk about how to achieve work-life balance through clear communication and adaptability. Whether you're an entrepreneur starting out on a seasonal business leader looking to refine your approach, this episode is packed with practical takeaways to help you innovate, grow, and thrive. Without further ado, here is my interview with Bensi. Bensi, thank you so much for joining me on the Let's Talk Business podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Manny. Thank you. So I've been following your journey. I've been seeing you at shows. I've been following you some of the content that you're putting out on LinkedIn and other social platforms. And you actually dabble in a very interesting space. I think um, a couple of years ago, we actually had the, one of the C-level executives from Rosetta Stone on the show. And it was a great episode. And we spoke about uh, like language barriers and what that does for a person in a professional and in, in, in a professional manner, as far as how they incre- you know as they do business and other other areas of life. But this is a little interesting: who you're targeting, what you're teaching them, and so on and so forth. So, for our listeners, before we get into the business side of things, tell us a little bit about who you are. Okay, um, so my name is Ben C. L. Kubi. Um, originally from the UK. Um, eventually ended up coming to, to uh, Yeshiva, Talmudical College over here in the U.S. And then after that, you know, did a couple of years in Israel, eventually met my wife from California, which and uh, in a surprising turn of events, uh, I ended up totally uprooting my life in the U.K., moving to the U.S. And while in the, while in, you know, significant to this podcast or to the business, while in the, while living in Israel, a friend of mine who had come from a community that spoke that spoke English as a second language started this company, and um, you know, after I, I I went in with him like right from the start, just spent a couple of hours, and believe it or not, I started off by coaching people in English, and then uh, eventually, after it was between eight to ten months, you know, we realized that maybe it wouldn't, you know, he wasn't fully passionate passionately into it. So uh, I was super young, never had a penny to my name, and uh, and he mentioned an insane amount, an in, like an insane price. He said, "Listen, Bensi, if you want to buy me out, like I'd be open to that." At the time, I was I didn't know the first thing about business, and uh, and I pride myself on still saying that I still don't know the first thing about business, but uh, but just to, as as we go, as we go, we're all we're all we're all learning on a, you know day to day, and it was between a loan and investors. And I actually reached out. I actually, it's, it's funny. I see a couple of podcasts ago, you had uh, Yankee Markowitz from SBA Loan Group on the podcast. Um, so I reached out to him. I'd seen his face. Very nice guy. Such a nice guy. They have their marketing game down pat, or so uh, at least, at least I, I'm a proof of that. Um, so I give him a call, um, and I really didn't know the first or last thing. I remember them asking for P&Ls, and like, I, I knew nothing about business, literally nothing at all, um, which is funny because a couple of months earlier, by a freak of nature, I'd, I'd gone and applied to a business school. I got accepted, but uh, for whatever reason, you know, this fell into my lap, and I ended up pursuing this deferring school. So I called him up, asked him for a loan, and then surprising, surprising turn of events, uh, he, him and his partner, Mandy Wilenkin, uh, they put their faith behind me and they went ahead and invested. We bought the company out and thank God we have been on a trajectory of growth, you know, not, 
Thank God, yeah. That's the quick story behind it, yeah. So, so tell us more about uh, what you do actually, you know, and, and, and I want to go in, I want to go into some more details about it. A hundred percent. So I start, started off like literally doing everything from the coaching to operations and to researching softwares that would work for us to sales. I was literally like doing everything. I, I remember like not even knowing the terms. I, I literally, I didn't know how to like make a sale or anything. Um, I had a little experience like from when I was a kid. It's very funny. When I was a kid, I started off. I think it was my first, my first business uh, when I was uh, 14 years old. I remember, you know, around the synagogues within the Manchester, UK area, they used to. So people for ad, you know, advertising people hang up these little, you know, posters. And uh, I went ahead and remember that one person came to me and said, "Hey, Bensi, for 25 pounds a week, a week, which is roughly what 33, 35 dollars," and he said, "For 25 pounds a week, would you go around these 52 synagogues and hang up these posters?" And I was like, "Okay, let's try it." And then it really ballooned. I, I was always just like my main focus was like real customer service and making sure that if I did, I did it properly. So it was another guy that did it, and he would take like the eight posters, hang them up on one pin, and expect you know. The, whoever the organizer was of that synagogue to go and then hang them nicely. But I was always careful not to cover any other notices. And I really, I remember just like really taking care of the, the customers. I had no idea what profit was. So I, I ran at a loss and had no idea. I just spent the money as a 14 year old. And uh, as, you know, life moves along, you just, I, I, it's just something I've seen so much, how, how people, you know, really, they spend, they spend, they spend, and they think money's coming in. And let's say, they, hey, we did $10,000 in sales today. And then they'll go back and because there's no, uh, you know, because there's no real structure and accountability for specific amounts, you know, what's going out and what's coming in. We currently offer, so for people that speak English as a second language, sometimes they can, it can really get in the way. Um, whether they live in America or England or Australia or an English speaking uh, country, or if they want to globalize further. So let's say, for example, we have people working in high tech or we have people working even, you know, sometimes these outsourced workers, you know, working from Dominican Republic or the Philippines, they want to work for American companies, which is obviously much more lucrative for them. Uh, they find that this is definitely the, you know, the first step in, 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 in opening themselves up to more opportunities. That's what we do. Uh, recently, we've also just expanded a little more. Um, we have a couple of other languages. We just started Spanish, um, which thank God is going is is going well. Um, a lot of people who have Spanish speaking employees find it very hard to communicate with them, and we're trying to break that barrier too. We've joined up with uh, we've collaborated with multiple colleges to help even even students who speak English as a first language when it comes to essay writing and you know APA style or whatever it is. So really, it's 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 an on, on an academic level, but the, our bottom line is really results. Right. So it's, it's funny you said that you brought on someone else. Um, but th th there is a statistic out there. Let's say, for example, that, I, you know, we all it, it, software, you know, you can sign up to do a lingo or whatever. There's a statistic out there that only three percent of people actually finish online courses or whatever. So we saw that break. And we also we wanted cultural sensitivity as well towards specific communities. So we really want to be able to service that. So that's our core service. English Advancement 101, really concierge. And uh, yeah, thank God. Nice. So, so the end of like the, the way you you actually deliver the value and the services is with one on one um, coaching. Correct. We're, we're slightly moving over to ed tech. So I'm not sure if you're familiar. The ed tech, um, the ed tech is a uh, uh, industry is 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 billions of dollars. It's a it's billion dollar industry. Um, so. People generally, if they, if they want to make it the most profitable, they, they don't want to have to have human involvement. So they'll set up a software, or they'll set up whatever they'll set up. So what, what, what we're kind of doing is we're going really old school, and that's what really attracts our client base. So even though it may not be as profitable because there's the passion there too, we do the one-on-one, -on -one, the human involvement. We're moving slightly towards a hybrid situation where people can also go online, use our website, whatever it is. But that's, that's our thing. Yeah. Let me ask you some a follow up question. So obviously you're leading a company and, and there is planning involved, there's sales involved, there's marketing involved, there is a lot of, you know, different uh, parts. And obviously you learned on the job, as you mentioned before, humbly mentioned before. Still learning. Yeah. Still learning. We never, you know, we, we never stop learning. Uh, I always say the, the business owner that stops learning, uh, something is, something is off. <laughs> something is off. Especially with uh, today's day and age, with so many advancements on, on all sides of you know, from from 
HR to to how things are being played out, how people's uh, um, attention span, and so many different things. I guess my question to you is, um, as a leader, how much of this? Like, what's what's your? Di- how does a day in your life look like as a leader? So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. Um, I still struggle balancing my day. You know, first of all, HR, for example. I, I, I never even just when I started when, uh, working for the people I bought the business out from, I was that kind of guy who just like grinded for, I think it was $22 an hour. Originally it started even lower, like $20 an hour. I was in a tiny apartment in Israel, four computer screens set up on my dining room table. And I didn't, I, like, I never expected anything from them besides a paycheck, but I really, really grinded. Um, so it was all new to me, like the whole HR we saw at the beginning, we had a very fast, you know, I'm not, not embarrassed to say it, it just happens. If you don't know what HR is, we had a very fast, quick turnover. You know, people came, they weren't satisfied, they moved on. I think it was a year and a half ago, we hired a, you know, a director of operations. I finally started, you know delegating some tasks of, of the C-suite. And it was her who really pointed out to me that, you know, HR is important. We got to keep them happy. We started sending little gifts. And then uh, recently now we have Jacob Freelander. I don't know if you know him, but he's he's our director of operations and he fights tooth and nail for our employees. So it's funny, he works for me, but he fights for them. And I'm slowly like learning, like I used to be someone who used to ask me for like two weeks off in the middle of the year. And remember two weeks off, people have scheduled, sometimes a year in advance, people have scheduled lessons. You look at our calendar, it looks like all hell has broken loose. Um, so it's, 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 it's really, and I used to like, why are you taking two weeks off? Like it's a business, whatever, that, that's the way it runs. We have a contract. And like, I, I used to just like, expect people to let's say for example i needed two minutes of work here two minutes of work there i expected people to do stuff without being paid and 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 i'm okay saying this i because i expected everyone to have the same work ethic as as what i had grown up with aka like british old school work 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 um but now i'm really learning on that so hr so whether it's hr uh tech for example i'm super old school i like just recently Again, this Jacob Freelander, director of opera, like he's like, let's automate this and let's automate that. And we, we actually, we've now instituted innovation hour, where for one hour a week, we sit down together and say, okay, let's run through our business model. Once again, what can we automate? What can we automate? What other softwares can we get to, you know, take, besides we're taking away from, you know, having to pay people to do that, you know, uh, humans to do that. Besides for saving from that, it also saves from human error. Right. And gives a lot of clarity on the client end. So, so yeah, so it's between HR, learning new softwares. I'm also heavily involved in sales, really heavily involved in sales. Uh, we just expanded, the, you know, we're starting to build out the sales team, but it, it, I, I'm not far along enough that journey that I have a great structure to my day, but, uh, you know, definitely touch base on, on really on everything. And then I, I, a few, a few students, I'd like to stay in the game in the trenches with the teachers. So a few students, I actually coach myself, but that's, that's what a regular day looks like for me. Yeah. It's amazing that you're sharing it. And I think, I think, um, one of the reasons that I brought you on the show is I want to hear the story because, you know, obviously sometimes that we have these, uh, we have CEOs of larger companies that have gone through years of experience and now they have a whole team and everything. And sometimes it's very hard to relate to the young guy just passionate about a product and service and starting their business and really grinding it from, you know, without even looking at, at, at the clock, so to speak, like whatever hours they have. And, and sometimes it's important, but it's equally important at one point to figure out, okay, I've done enough of that. This won't get me to the next stage. Now I have to start changing my mindset. And, and there's, a, there's a course that I give, which is called the Leaders Forum, um, with like 10 business owners at a time. And I mainly did it out of passion because these are questions that keep on coming, coming to my desk. And I said at one point, what if I do like a day training and, and bring in those leaders and speak to them? And I, I always start off the same way. I, I, I asked the question like, what is the biggest challenge uh, of that you feel you face in business? And the natural response of people is growing my business. That's the biggest challenge, growing my business. My response to that is always that, that it's actually very easy to grow a business. Think, speak to every business owner that started off. I would say, I wouldn't say every, but most of the business owners, let's say they came from the industry. They know the industry. They had a passion to the product. They were good at everything that they did business needs and they started the business. And all of a sudden they went to the friends, family, community, and they, the first few months was great. 
Like, you know, I couldn't believe it will have this amount of clients in this, this short period of time. And, and they, they're so excited. And then you speak to the same business owner six months in, 12 months in, and it starts wobbling that, that feeling. Why? Because growing the company is not, is not hard. Managing the growth is the hard part. Now that I have to start scaling, I have to start bringing in my system, I have to start creating systems, processes. And most companies that fail, fail at that stage. They don't fail about growing the business. They fail about managing the growth of their business. I cannot agree. I cannot agree more just when it comes to processes, systems, dealing with the growth. I like that. The growth isn't the challenge. The dealing with the growth is the challenge. I like that. Yeah. Hey listeners, are you struggling to create beautiful looking proposals? Is it a hassle every time you need to prepare a quote or proposal for your clients? Is collecting signatures still a manual process? Well, it's time to upgrade to Pandadoc. At PTAX, we use Pandadoc for all our proposals, employee documentation, and so much more. It saves us time, keeps everything organized, and our documents look incredibly professional. With customizable templates, real-time collaboration, and e-signatures, Pandadoc turns creating documents into quick and easy steps. Plus, it integrates with so many other tools, streamlining your workflow and boosting productivity. Try Pandadoc today by visiting ptex.co slash Pandadoc and start your free trial. Trust me, it's going to be a game changer for your business. That's ptex.co slash P-A-N-D-A-D-O-C. I saw, I commend you for what you mentioned that oh, at one point figuring out I need to bring in the director of operations. I need to bring in HR because... At, at, at that scalability, when you hit that mark, that's exactly when you, you have to start changing your, your th- thinking process and saying, you know what, I'm, I have to go away from that grinding, grinding, grinding to what will, what will move the needle forward in my business for scalability? Oh, I need a person there. I need a person here or I need systems and processes. So that's why exactly I wanted to hear from you. And I appreciate that, that, you know, that, um, uh, humility of uh, sharing that you know you weren't there in the beginning because most people weren't there in the beginning but then you start learning it and sometimes you hire the first person and they're not working out and then we have to uh, change that person but uh, eventually you start creating a system around the services and products that you offer sorry can i just mention the flip side like i remember so i remember like uh, it all got real like i think we hired our 15th employee and um and i i was still like just really like handling them all myself and like a ton of slack messages every day it was crazy um and i called a, spoke to a friend of mine who was still taking out business loans you know to grow his business um but he wasn't putting he he delegated early so there really is that balance of knowing like what you're saying is amazing right that obviously one has to know that as they scale in ratio they have to you know match up the you know being open to you know delegating correctly and really scaling and that's that's a difficult part of growing a business it's not just getting the clients or whatever um however there are those who hire premature who hire prematurely delegate prematurely and and they go into the black hole of debt before you know doing that initial year or two of hustle or whatever it is but it's definitely it's a challenge it's the challenge exactly and i i appreciate you mentioning this yeah doing those things too early which means you didn't prove the concept or you you don't have the financial means or whatever it is will also put you know will also be have a, a, a negative effect in your business Obviously, you're in a people's business, which means is uh, it's all human interaction. So there's two sides to it. It's your own team. And then there's obviously your team conveying the same attitude and the same culture to the people that they're working with. Uh, what can you share about your systems and processes or even the attitude towards your team? How do you making sure that every mentor, every coach, whatever you call it, speaks to the client the same way Bensi would have spoken to that client? Okay, that's an awesome question. Um, so first of all, in the in the I'm just going to call it the olden days, but in the in the beginning, let's say for example today this morning, um, a client I'm I'm just going to you know put them up to, against each other. A client called and said, you know I I got on this I got on this coaching session with a teacher, and now this teacher does not live in the United States. It was 11 p.m you know, where he was. And he was like, he, you know, the, the client complained that he was su- super tired and he wasn't, he wasn't, you know, performing the best and everything. Uh, in the olden days, I would have just gone and I would have gone all out on the, on, on the, on the coach. I would have called him up and said, what's going on? We have to, you know, you have to be on top of your game. You know, if you need to lessen your hours, that's your call, but you have to be on top of your game. And today I, 
I like I, I saw that like I, that's what I used to do. I reached out to, 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 the, to the teacher and I said, please, can you just give me an overall, uh, you know, synopsis, you know, succinct synopsis of what went on during that lesson. And he he portrayed it all to me. And I saw that that was the, the obvious gap. It just wasn't the right match, you know, the student with the coach. Um, so I think definitely giving the benefit of the doubt and conveying to your team that you are 100 percent loyal to them. Right. Rather than the client. Now, obviously, client a very american saying i don't know how you know i don't know how faithful this is but they say client is god right now it's a very american saying um i i i, I wouldn't want to stay with that the whole time but usually you know that's the way it works you know client says you know you know a vendor does but uh, i i really feel like conveying to your team that no no, no i'm first going to check with you and make sure that indeed there is a claim i think putting the loyalty and trust within them really empowers them Number two is, and this is something we set up just starting two months ago, every single sale that is made in the company, company-wide, any sale that comes in, every single employee gets something. And this, and this is something that I would have never dreamt of doing. And, 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 and it's just, it's, it's, you know, especially with the, the, the climate nowadays, it's a, we, we, some people say, you know, everybody's looking for jobs. It's funny. I was just looking at someone, someone's social media last night. He was saying everybody's looking for jobs. But on the other hand, I still feel that since COVID, we haven't gotten out of that employee's world where everybody knows, that, you know, everybody's trying to, you know, make personal brands or become influencers or become, you know, that there are so many other ways to make money besides going to a nine to five job that I still feel it's an employee's world. And you've just, you've, you've got to hustle in that way. And, and, and although I'm not used to it, really HR every two weeks as well with a remote team, it's really hard. Every two weeks we have just a meeting for a half hour. Additionally, every month they can, just so that I speak to them outside of work, get to know them. Who are, who are they? So they can all book 15 minute sessions with me to speak to me. And it's just been so productive. Um, it just automatically goes into my calendar and that's 15 minutes. They can speak about whatever they'd like. Um, I think really humanizing it, um, bonus it, you know, if you give them some sort of profit share equity, and I know it's really hard for a small business owner to, to do because he's like, oh, I'm only making a hundred dollars on this deal. Give them 50 cents. That's it. Just 50 cents. They have to feel that they are adding to the overall value of the company and that the company knows and the company shows appreciation through profitability for each one of them. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, beautiful. Um, I, I want to speak about another topic is obviously, um, you know, in the world of business, we know there's there's needs and there is wants, um, you know, when it comes to pr buying in product in particular. Uh, and you always want to be in the the need versus the need business, you'll be you're providing a need versus a want because when the economy is tough or any, any type of things, they have to make a decision where to allocate the money. How would you say you're framing your service for your potential client? Great question. Luxury or necessity? I would definitely say necessity. Uh, meaning, of course, we get those people who reach out to us that just want it. You know, let's say, for example, we started recently, we started a Yiddish teaching track that we teach Yiddish. So obviously our first few clients were people who out of necessity, you know, a dentist from Teaneck who needs to speak Yiddish to his, you know, Hasidic clients or um, a lawyer in New York City who has two Hasidic paralegals and doing a deposition wants to be able to just, you know, shout across the table. It's These are actual clients. Um, but uh, but uh, but th then we get these, you know, we got one older woman recently who just does a linguist. She wants to explore the Yiddish language. You know, she comes from Jewish ancestry. I'm not even sure if she herself is Jewish, but, uh, but obviously we do have the luxury, but we, our, our, our target niche when it comes to marketing is definitely the necessity market. Cause exactly, as you said, economy hits hard, people are allocating their money, you know, to necessities, not to luxuries. And how do you, how do you communicate that? Because, um, you know, sometimes if you see a product and service in general, you could, uh, you know, you walk by the store, you see it, if it's a service, it's a, you know, landscape, you know, scape, or even a marketing agency, you know, when you need them. At which point does, does a person feel that, oh, I need to work on my language and therefore are this fluent talk? Like, like, what is that process of, of, uh, wh wh where do you find that? Where do you find those people in order to make sure that they understand that you have their need? A hundred percent. So to be honest, um, um, we, we, we've asked, we ask every client, you know, how long have you been thinking about this? On average, I would say an, an average client, imagine you're doing, Eng uh, you know, you have to do business in, Spanish or Portuguese or Mandarin, whatever it was. So if you would have to do that and you had a broken Mandarin, you would think about that at least once a day. You would think, why don't I know that language? 
if only I knew that language, if only I was able to speak. So obviously the clients that we're reaching out to, they're, they're selling themselves. In essence, they're selling themselves. What we have to do when we come to a marketing game, our marketing approach is just mirror to them that we understand exactly their pain point and that's what we're coming to solve. So it's very funny. We some, some of our marketing videos we spent thousands of dollars on and one of them we spent $90 on. I went with an amateur video, videographer to a park here in Nevada. We videoed it and you know I edited it just a tiny drop and it's been our best performing video. Why? Because basically I, I get out of a car and I say, you know, I've got 30 seconds to grab your attention as every elevator, elevator sales pitch. You know, a lot of people in, within the communities and the people we service are in sales. And then I do a three, three second hesitation where the video just goes click, click, click and three second hesitation. And then I say, do you want to be that guy? You know, let's say you're an insurance salesman or in marketing or whatever you're in, you want to sell something, you have to grab their attention and you've got a three second hesitation. It just sets everything off from the beginning. Do you want to be that guy? And that has been our best performing video because it mirrors the pain point of the client exactly. I think that's the bottom line. So to answer your question, I really feel that they are selling themselves. They realize themselves on a daily basis. They struggle. People struggle. When it comes to educating the client, that it is a necessity. That's more for like people who like do business in one country and have always thought about putting out content in in efforts, you know, to to to, to eventually globalize, but they're not sure. That that already comes to education, but that's not our that's not our, our, our core clientele. Our core clientele are people who do business in English already. Yeah. Speaking about that video, because I saw that video, um, I, I want to ask you a follow up question, which is, um, and this is a a common question business owners ask me when it comes to branding and marketing. You know, once upon a time, people were only, you know, building the company's brand. And today we live in a world that you could also build your personal brand. And sometimes they interconnect or sometimes they're separate. My biggest struggle, by the way, this is my biggest struggle. Oh, it's terrible. That's what I'm asking. That's what I'm asking. So, so obviously, as you're growing a your company, people see you at shows, people see you as the, as a spokesperson on videos and stuff like that. How do you separate that a, a person thinking, Oh, I'm going to get Bensi to be my, my teacher, so to speak? I, I struggle. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I struggle immensely with it. Really, really, really struggle immensely with it. Even, you know, whether it comes to exposure or things like, you know, so someone, someone recently came to me, I love your energy. I want you to train my team in sales, right? Which I'm, I'm fine with doing. But then I really knew that he could be a client for Fluent Talk. He was reaching out because he liked my energy. Then this, could, this also goes into the, like, the whole topic of like, do you become friends with your clients or not? Because once you're friends with them, on the one hand, you can guilt them into buying from you. But on the other hand, it's not relation. It's not a good relationship for the sale because if you need to put your foot down to, you know, to enforce policies, uh, I'm going to put it straight across to you, straight, straight back on you. You know what I mean? You do this podcast. People know many Hoffman. You show up at shows. You you give presentations, and then people come. But how do you know that people are coming to you for your marketing skill rather than they've fallen in love with your personality? Good question. I'll answer it because I think uh, maybe there's other people on that listen to the show have the same question. So. It took a couple of years. To, there was a very fogginess between, let's say, the personal brand and the business brand. At one point, actually, and, and if you come to our office, you'll see it on my walls right over on top, and then you'll see it on the literature of PTEX, that I separated my brand from the PTEX brand, which means is it came a point where I wanted to help everybody. So everybody could be a customer, come in, we'll do ads, we'll do stuff like that. At one point, my team became way more sophisticated and the type of projects they wanted to do and the type of project they were able to deliver tremendous value was a certain type of client, a certain stage of a business and so on and so forth. And at that point I said, you know what? Okay, so many have and loves to help people and, and I could help any type of person in any, in any scenario. Why Ptex cannot? Because the way they structure themselves and the team and everything else, they can't. So we actually went and developed se separate mission statements, separate core values and everything into those two. So if you come to my office, you'll see, I believe every person should be given the, uh, the opportunity to succeed in life. That's my mission statement. And therefore, I'll sit with people for paid. I'll sit with people for volunteer slots. I'll sit with teenagers that are at risk and they're looking for somebody to give them a half an hour to figure out what the next step is. However, you come to PTEX, you'll deal with, you know, we work with um, driven brands looking to create their next. 
So in that message is driven brands that are looking to create the next. Now, those are two separate. Now, I could be the spokesperson of PTEX as far as the leader and the CEO of PTEX. Now, it comes to an event, a person will say, I want to meet with you. And my second, my question will be right away, tell me more about it. And if it's going to be a business question or something related to what I could provide, they'll meet with me. The second they'll say, even before the meeting or actually I meet with them. So what do you suggest I should do on marketing? What do you suggest I do on branding? I'll say, listen, my team is more equipped to answer that question at the time. And I'm going to set you up with one of my team members because I want they should own the conversation. I want they should prescribe what needs to happen and they should be there to deliver every step of the way. So I'm still CEO. If somebody will have a question or somebody have a, a challenge later on, whatever it is, they could reach out to me. But when they come into the funnel, it's going to be very obvious why they're coming in. So hence the, the, the podcast, some people will say, you're not selling enough p on the podcast. You know, if it's a p podcast, the answer is, you know, business will come, you know, you know, you know, God has his ways and his plans, but the goal over here is to deliver value. And as soon as you deliver value, people will come to you and then will navigate where they need to land as far as what their needs are. But it's a, a very important um, reason because I need to give the space for my people and my brand to be to live way beyond me as a personal brand. Versus sometimes you could see an accountant where he or she is the face of the brand and people say, I need to sit with that person end of the year. I need to sit with that person to review my questions. Although at one point could be they have great people that can even be better answering that tax question than the, the original accountant was. So it's a fine line. However, what I do say is if you don't have the capacity to do both or there's no need to, 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 to do both, then you start off one way, which you could be the personal brand because you could be very relatable to your target audience. At one point you start, you know, channeling those people into understanding that the company is way bigger than myself. That's great. That's great stuff. I, I feel I feel like I should have interviewed you rather than you interviewing me, huh? <laughs> no, no, it's a conversation. It's a conversation. So uh, now we're going to get to the meat and the potatoes of the interview. So you teach, obviously, um, um, you know, the different languages that you teach and your team, actually. Um, and you speak to uh, people that have that need, as we mentioned before. Uh, I want to try to give away some secrets to people that are listening to the show. I want to understand from you, Again, English wasn't my first language as well, but I learned with time and I, and I speak the way I speak. You know, like I've, I've had guests ask me, like, do you want to, like, the way I learn? This is what, this is who I am. This is what I speak. How much of the teaching that you teach is the, just the English, English language? And how much is it of how to use what in terms of conversations? Because you live in a world and I, we had guests on the show where, you're in a sales meeting, yeah? You could use professionally the English language, yet you're not going to close the sale. You're not going to have a good read in the room. You're not going to be able to move the conversation forward. And then there's techniques and ways of how to get the person to speak, how to get the people, people to open up. So which of the two is it? Is it a mixture of both? I, I think we're really focused more on the language. Now, it happens to be that our, our coaches aren't just like, you know, uh, uh, aren't just, you know, people who happen to speak English. They're not just academics. There are, you know, we have a couple of like highly accomplished, you know, PhDs and, 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 and professors. Um, and and the, the, quite a few of them have dabbled in different areas. So they're really able to coach and further coaching. So let's say, for example, um, you know, if someone says, um, let's say I have a student who says, Bensi, how would you, yeah, okay, very nice. You've taught me the English, you know, for us, you know, let's say sometimes businessmen want to run over their typical pitch. You know, they meet someone on a plane, there's potential for, a touch, a touch base over there. How would I do that? So we'll run through the grammar. We'll run through the grammar rules as well to help them for the future. And then he would say, Ben, see, what's the approach you would take? Of course, I'd, I'd try as much as possible. We, our bottom line, and that's our mission statement. We want to value, 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 value. Um, but to be honest, I think it's more, you know, it's, it's really, it's really to, to, to I, I wouldn't say we, we, we dabble in other areas much, um, unless it comes to, unless it comes to, you know, college students who are, you know, heading for their exams or heading for their essays, then obviously we really break it down for them, how you want to present an idea to perform best in your class and all of that stuff. But for regular businessmen, we don't dabble too much in the presentation side, you know, rather strictly on the grammar and vocabulary, you know, as to the English language. Yeah. 
So, so for our listeners, just to give them away a tip or two, um, what would you say from your experience, what you've seen with others, um, where, where are the places where people can make immediate change in order to become better? That's a tough one. It's really a tough one. It's funny because on our sales calls, we always tell people, hey, we don't do magic and this is going to take you a long time. We'd like to scare them away first. And then if they're not scared, we realize they're a real prospect. But from your experience, you have seen people come in and where, where's the, the most challenging places where they're facing? Right. Do you mean I, I could give like a grammar tip that people really struggle with? If, if, you, if you want that, it's interesting. Um, so most languages in the world, let's say, for example, an action word, right? Let's say, for example, I walk, I talk, I drive, I work. Most languages don't have a separate form of that verb, of the action for progressive in general. Now I'm throwing around these terms. By the way, during our lessons, we try to not use terms at all because we're results driven. We don't want to turn you into a professor. But basically, if I'm in the middle of driving, that's when we use driving with the ing in English, right? If I'm not in the middle of driving, it's something I still do presently, but it's generally, I don't use that ing. I drive to work every day. And so I drive to work every day is generally, if you're in the middle, it's I'm driving, right? Or I'm walking, I'm talking. And two things. First of all, over 50% of our sentences every day are action words. So someone who struggles with this, even just this tip, being able to integrate it, and there are exercises to integrate it, but even just integrating this, you've already helped over 50% of your sentences be more correct. Okay? That's one mind-blowing statistic. And another thing is that over 50% of the languages in the world actually do not have two different forms. Okay. Um, you know, they'll just have the, they'll, they'll, they'll have drive, but they'll have, I drive generally. And then I drive now, or, or, you know, I drive now, they'll add another word for now, just like in Yiddish, right? I, I don't, for, for those, I don't speak Yiddish. You say, yes, you add that onto the action. And that's why we just fuse it all into one because they're like, oh, I'm saying the action word. There's only one action word because they're not used to it. But really the, in English, unlike many other languages, there's an actual, just, you add the ing only when you're in the middle. But if it's in general, just use that root of the word. <laughs> that's like a random tip. I think that's our, yeah. Very cool. So, so let me ask you something in which more related to writing, but I think this is also a very common um, challenge that people are having when to use the comma versus uh, the period in starting a new sentence. That's a, ch a challenge, but I think generally we put a comma. I can go into the academic part of it if you want me to delineate it. Go for it. Okay. Basically, a sentence. What's a sentence? The classification of a sentence in English grammar is that there is an action or a description going on in the sentence, right? So let's say, for example, I pick up my phone and say, this phone is blue. That's a description or an action, you know, I call my dad every week, whatever it is. There's one, so there's one person, one action. You know, once someone doing the person doing the action. A comma is generally used when it's called, it's, you know, it's a longer sentence with two people and two actions or, you know, one action and, and that there are two parts of the sentence that can either be split into two sentences, but sometimes it sounds more eloquent to push it into one sentence. So let's say, for example, I woke up this morning and I ate breakfast. So really that would classify as two sentences because there are two actions, two people and two actions, right? Two people doing the actions and two actions. That would classify as two separate sentences. Compound sentences is called or complex sentences depending where you come from. Instead of that, we can just use a comma after the first language and following the comma, you would use a conjunction, a you know, a joining word, whether it's and, but, so, except, besides, it could be a bunch of different ones, therefore, but that's generally when we would use a comma. If it's, you know, two things that could classify as two, uh, two, two different senses, but they do have to do with each other and they have, they're, they're running a sequence, we would use a comma. A period really ends event one and begins event two. I hope that's clear. And I really don't want to get geeky here, but I, I really hope that, I really hope that helps. Yeah. Do, do you suggest like a part of your, like when you speak, if, when you work with your um, students, uh, do you suggest tools like Grammarly or stuff like that to, to be companions or you get used to that and, and, and you really want the person to, to learn it from, from the get go? It's a great question. And this opens up to the whole question of guys call me up and say, my grandfather became a millionaire and he never knew a, a, you know, a word of English. And I tell him, you are 100% right. Two things. First of all, he was one out of 100 people. Okay. The other 99, you know, struggle. Number two is even if the other 99 don't struggle, they would have gotten there quicker, you know, or they would have felt more confident, um, uh, you know, had they, had they been equipped with the skills. Um, as for Grammarly, I think it depends what kind of person you are. If you're a person, if you're the kind of person who will use the Grammarly 
in conjunction with the lessons, then you'll see how Grammarly will correct you. And then you'll say, oh, it's because of that. And the more you're triggered, the more you can integrate. Always, we want to trigger you as much as possible and then integrate. You want, So now, uh, many after this phone call, let's say you go and meet someone else and he makes that ing mistake, you'll be triggered. Then you can start integrating. That's just the way it works. Um, if you hear someone else, all the more so. We, we're always quicker to correct other people and you know grab other people's mistakes. But I think using Grammarly like that. But if you lose Grammarly just loose-headedly and not thinking into it, then sometimes it can disable. And just sometimes Grammarly doesn't get the context. Um, but uh, but 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 I think overall, listen, use the tools, use AI. I'm not, you know, if, if someone calls me and says, "Listen, I struggle with my speaking, with my reading, right? I'm not good, but I use AI. I use this. I use that." 2024, baby. Use what you need. <laughs> you know, what I mean, use what you need. We're here to deliver value. If you feel that you can get that, in, in, you know, elsewhere for cheaper, go for it. 100. percent Very cool. I'll ask you a final question, which is: um, um, Now that you're building the business, the business is growing, um, and and you have different people, how do you deal with work-life balance? So, used to be terrible at this, and I still think I'm not the best at this. Um, it's funny because, uh, again, for your listeners that are not Jewish, the way it works in the Jewish world is that we have a matchmaker, okay? Like before one gets, when one is ready to go into the, you know, to the period of like looking for a match, that we have a matchmaker. And, you know, just to sift out, you know, irrelevant matches, then we have something called a resume, right? Or a CV, just like one has a work CV, a match CV. And it's funny because in Britain, it's not just, it's not just Jewish culture. You, you know, it's Indian culture and it's very British, old British culture. They actually have matchmakers, right? The royal family uses a matchmaker. So on my resume, I put it in there. I remember putting it in there. And uh, this was even before I'd gotten involved in business at all. But I, I, I put it in there already that I'm going to need someone who will understand that when I start the business, I'm going to be like 100% in. So that's just a, fu- a funny, a funny anecdote. Um, I have not worked it out yet. Just being 100% honest. Generally, I try not to schedule anything set in stone after 5 p.m. Uh, but uh, rather, you know, it, it, on a day, you know, I'll, I'll text my wife, "Hey, can I take a meeting after, you know, five, uh, you know, after five? Then I'll do it every now and again." And also, I'm just going to be 100% honest. If sales have been down that day, I'll sit in the office for a couple extra hours. It's funny because I really feel that work-life balance is important. However, I feel that the, this culture, it's like becoming a whole culture of like life is, you know, just work three hours a day and people expect results from like nothing. I'm going to throw this over to you because, you, you know, you, you, you're older than me and yeah, I'm, I'm sure you've had more experience with this. But, uh, you know, I mean, we... I'm sure you remember the days when people just used to work, work, work until until things exploded. And I feel that nowadays teenagers just aren't aware. I, I can see from our younger employees as well. Even though I'm pretty young myself, I was brought up old school. I see from my younger employees, they really expect like, you know, to really be successful financially, even though they don't necessarily put in the work because yeah. Yeah, it's 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 so true. But uh, like my my um definition of work-life balance is giving it 100% when they when it when it's needed so which means is sometimes your business needs 100% you're running a new business you're starting a new business so you have a very you know a season whatever it is and and sometimes your family needs you 100% and the goal is whenever your family needs you 100% they know you're there for for them 100% and your business associates know I have to take a break because I'm now dealing with the family hopefully for good things, but, but you have to be with a family. And same as with a business. When you have to put in a lot of hours in the business, the challenge is not letting the you know, neglecting your family. The challenge is people forget to let the, the their family know that I'm going through a, a struggle or I'm going through a hard, you know, busy season and be at my side. All of a sudden you find out that your spouse is bringing you lunch that day in the office because they they were aware that you're going through some busy days or you're subbing for a coworker that's out of the office. And I think that's that's what's missing. And I, and I feel that was called balance. Balance is not 50-50. It's like marriage. You always say, how much do I need? Like I was 100% myself. Now I have a spouse. How much do I need to give her? You need to give her 100% or she needs to give you 100%. It's not 50-50. So the same is the same as with work life balance. And I think that's what's missing that if you look back old school people, they were home five o'clock. But if this person is tense, they have to cover the bank or they know that they're, they're left clients hanging and so on and so forth. They're not present. So what's the purpose? That's not called work life balance. So I think, I think, um, business owners need to have that balance in terms of understanding, but they need to bring in the other side. 
that they know what's happening and communication. And, and it comes down, business is all about communication. Personal development is also all about communication as well. If I can tap this just for one second, just as, just, just as a, you know, encouragement for people from, from, you know, let's say, for example, a lot of your viewership are from the Hasidic community and where we are of the, you know, of the, you know we're very into family life, building family, like right away, even being young, just to realize that we have it we have it double or triple, you know, let's just go tenfold, you know, as, as, as difficult as tough, because what's happening is, is that we start building businesses when the expenses are already there. So it's so much tougher than let's say your, your Elon Musk, who's building a business, you know, when he's got like at, at the beginning, I'm sure well, now he's got a whole brood, but I'm saying at the beginning, you know, he, or Jeff Bezos, or, you know, you can go through them. And uh, it, it's really, it's, 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 it's amazing what people are pulling off, but just to realize that it's, it's, yeah, it's tough. Listen. Let's end on that as well, is um, if there's people listening and they're younger, they're thinking of going into business or they're struggling and they're in business, what, what word of, words of encouragement do you have for them? I, I really think business and entrepreneurship is not for everyone. And I know this doesn't sound cool and isn't going to be made into a cool Instagram reel and splashed across there because people like hearing that everyone can make a million dollars on day one. But I really think that people have to think to themselves, you know, can my family handle it? Let's say you're, if you're married, can my spouse handle it? Can my kids handle it? And can I handle it? Some people cannot handle it. Um, now, a lot of people are forced into it because they live in places with like inflation like just just not regular expenses so they're forced into it but i really don't think it's for i I really think you should think to this maybe it's worth you know becoming an accountant doing nine till five instead of becoming an entrepreneur and trying to you know and trying to 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 rock it because it's really not that easy that the going is tough i love it i I think it's it's i think it's very important and we'll end with that where could people find out more about your business and and if they want to see more of your content Sure. So um, the business is myfluentalk.com. We've also got all the handles, you know, whether it's Instagram, YouTube, or TikTok. Um, and then we also have an, also on LinkedIn. And then for personal, um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm gener- I try to be as active as possible, but I definitely look through the DMs pretty pretty often. Or service at myfluentalk.com is our, is our main email, and anybody can reach out. And I really appreciate it, Benny. Sure. For the links, resources mentioned in this episode, check out the show notes at www.ptexgroup.com slash podcast. We're not finished. Let's close with the four rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Okay, go. Number one, a book to change your life. The Bible. Sorry, I don't read business books. (laughs) Good. Number two, a piece of advice you got that you'll never forget. Don't hustle to make sales. Hustle to make processes that will make you sales. Beautiful. Number three, anything you wish you could go back and do differently being more open to establishing and instituting real processes from the beginning instead of when you're drowning and you have to do them then. And last and final question, what's still on your bucket list to achieve? Being content, I would say, you know, if you walk out after a good day, a productive day, just being content instead of right away running for the next thing, I think. Bensi, thank you so much for joining us. I know your time is valuable. That is why in the name of our listeners, we'll forever be grateful for sharing some of your time with us today. It's been a blast. Thank you so much, Manny. My pleasure. And that's my conversation with Bensi al My takeaway from this one, number one, Bensi emphasizes the importance of proving business concepts and ensuring financial stability before expanding. His story serves as a reminder that strategic planning and cautious financial management are crucial, particularly in people-oriented businesses to achieve sustainable growth. Number two, The discussion highlights the challenges of managing dual identities as a business owner and public figure. Bensi shares strategies for maintaining clear boundaries between personal charisma and professional expertise, illustrating how personal mission statements for personal and business brands can enhance both interactions. Number three, Bensi's success story illustrates the value of building and maintaining a strong professional network. Engaging with peers and mentors provides diverse perspectives and opportunities, which can be a pivotal for personal growth and business success. Number four, Bensi emphasizes that a consumer-centric approach not only builds loyalty, but also drives innovation by encouraging feedback and iteration. And number five, transitioning from a teacher to a successful entrepreneur Bensi highlights how constantly acquiring new skills and adopting to changing business landscapes can drive growth and innovation. 
And that's a wrap for today's episode of the Let's Look Business podcast. I hope you enjoyed the practical, no-nonsense advice that our guests shared. If you found value in listening, I would be so grateful if you could share the episode with your friends and if you could give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever platform you listen. Subscribe to the show and get notified every time we publish a new episode. The Let's Talk Business Podcast is a P-Tex Group original production. Until next time, make it a great day.